accurate. It's being an original. Now, who am I? Um, I've spoken at Podcam for a number of years, so some of you might know who I am. Amy, you're not allowed to answer this. Mm. Anybody else know who I am? How would you describe me? Anybody? A mom? Yeah, I am a mom. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Um, um, as described by some people that I know, as described by some people I know, um, some of you may know the name Chris Brogan. He's actually the founder of Podcast. I asked Chris, how would he describe me? And um, Chris and I have been friends for many, many years. He said somebody with a big heart and a strong eye for community. Asked um, one of the bloggers who has worked under me. Um, you aspire daily to make positive changes and live a happy, inspired life. And from one of the agencies that I actually have worked on behalf of over the last six years, um, from my previous boss, Shannon Cohn, um, your true profession, professional community manager. This lady is your first and last choice for community management, and Holly is a genuine, trustworthy, and experienced social media expert. And the Financial Post, I think some of you may know of that paper, has called me the money smart mom. That's my personal branding. Over the last eight years, I have built that. I am. Um, 15 years ago, I was a mom on welfare. And basically at home, raising a special needs daughter. And I started a blog eight years ago. Basically, that basically led me to a life of di digital strategy and social media management. I've been working in the field for the last five years exclusively. And it's been my bread and butter. And I do it all freelance on behalf of several brides, just so you guys can know who I am. And when you have a real voice online, it leads to real numbers, it leads to sales, it leads to money in your bank accounts. Last year, I produced one billion social media, and let me say that number again, one billion social media impressions on behalf of the brands I worked with. Um, who were those friends? Um, anybody heard of Scotiabank? <laughs> That's one of them. Anybody heard of one of our sponsors, Kinetics? That was another one. Anybody heard of Manual Life? That was another one. Standard Life was another. Um, and then two of my favorites are startups. Anybody have a flip app on their phones? No? If you don't, you should. If you want, if you buy groceries, you actually should have the app on your phone, because it does save you money. But I've been their voice online for the last two years. And then there's a brand new Canadian app called Cattle, and I'm leading the community management for it. So what do you think an authentic voice is? I'm asking you guys. Anybody? Anybody else? Um, I think like a consistent uh, tone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things for me when I actually created the brand voice of Common Sense Mom, because I am the brand, was that it was me. It was real, the good and the bad. Um, if you've read any of my work online, it talks She's about teaching Facebook. them the right ways to handle social media at this age, rather than them stumbling into them, you know, themselves because you know, their parents aren't helping and that sort of thing. It's it's not a terrible situation, but that's sort of exactly. that, right? Is that it's it's part of the, the if you social look at my media. generation, yeah. my generation is extremely screwed up in the fact that they're posting literally everything that they do to this social media. 
what we need to do is get the kids at a younger age and have them have them realize that you posting you drinking with your friends when you're 19 is fun and all, but if you want to get into a professional business, somebody might go through your Facebook and drag things like that up. Yeah, when you're 23 and concerned about your branding, all of a sudden everything you've done in the last 10, 15 years online is not great. You're just like, oh, you know. right. Yeah. Um, I just want to go back to your example of uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. So, um, hi, I'm Talia. I'm from Smart Saver. So yes, Talia. So, you love what you do. And I actually find um, sometimes the inauthentic voice comes out a lot in um, the financial uh, people who are either doing finances, not, not your end of things, but selling items or trying to promote it. So what, so what we found is a lot of times we have to be doubly careful. Because when it sounds like it's, um, hey, we'll help you, and you know, whatever this is with financial. Um. And just to let you know who Smart Saver is, um, Smart Saver is actually a nonprofit, if I, re if I remember correctly. And they actually really push RSEPs, but they push it so that parents of lesser income kids can actually get the funds that they deserve. And getting the information out there. You guys actually do a really good work. Okay. That is actually really good work because there are a lot of kids that have a whole bunch of potential, but because of the situation that they are growing up in, they don't have the opportunity unless they're like a super student and get all of the grants. Yeah, we can talk later. Um, so I just wanted to say what we find is we have a really hard time sometimes, so I thought maybe you could address this. We have a hard time sometimes sharing what should be, I don't know, call it legitimate, authentic voices. You, know, you start, you, you almost have to look through to see what they're actually really about because yeah. we want to protect our um, audience. How many of you curate content? Share other people's stuff. How many of you really look at who you're sharing? How many of you vet who you're sharing? One of the biggest things I learned, because I screwed up um, many years ago, was the importance of vetting. And I actually became pre-anal. One of those um, things I do now on behalf of some marketing agencies is vet digital influencers. I actually go looking through your account, and I'm looking back and reading and analyzing and doing all that fun stuff because what you said, and you do have to go back and vet. Vetting is one of the most important things you can do to help your own brand. Vetting is so important. So if you go back and vet, and you review that person's content, and 90% is in line with your messaging. Yeah. 10% of that is like, mm, what do you do? If that 10%, it all depends how bad that 10% is. Um, for a while, I worked on the Canadian beef brand. Anybody know eat beef? Well, I was a voice for a while. I know chicken farmers and beef. I had both of them <laughs> as clients at the same time. Are you going after beef farmers to get the trifecta? <laughs> no, because I'm no long, I no longer do food. Now I do mostly apps and um, financial services. But to answer your question, it depends on that 10%. Like, when I was with Canadian Beef, I know it's a conservative brand, and I found we had really wanted to use a couple of digital influencers, when we really wanted to use them. And um, there was pictures of alcohol being drank, but more important than that, there was a lot of swearing. And I knew I couldn't get that digital influencer past the board. So it all depends what that 10% is. If it's something illegal, hell no, I'm not gonna use them. <laughs> Or if it's something ultra-religious and controversial, with that 10%, there's no way I would use that influencer or share that content. Because I can't. Like, uh, like I had to, s like to save my own hide and to save my own dollars, in a sense. I have to watch who I, who I share. Because it, it impacts often a dollar, a dollar amount. Anybody else? Just a question about authenticity. Mm -hmm. People's Twitter accounts, when it says RTs does not equal 
endorsements, and then they RT a lot. Your thoughts on this? Um, I retweet all the time, but if I've retweeted you, I've gotten read what you share. If you get a retweet from me, it's something that I actually do. Often people who do the retweets do not equal endorsements, haven't read or followed um, really the person, and they are trying to cover their asses for work. So that, yes. Sorry, are you finished? Yeah. I, I know you asked for negative examples, but what, in terms of authenticity, what um, stands out for me is the winners of a number of interesting elections, federal mm -hmm. and Ontario's. And I certainly um, came to believe that voters in Ontario voted in Kathleen Wynne because of her apparent authenticity, um, rather than waiting for backroom whispers, she confronted a number of issues head on, yeah. Yeah. and uh, came across as Not an authentic. I, I fully believe that uh, that was one of the deciding factors in the federal election too. Who's more authentic? Yeah, like, like if we want to look at the political game, like we watched what Stephen Harper did, and then we voted, basically based on what he said was saying at the time. Um, but at least he gave us what his version was, which I'm very thankful for. Um, any other question? When you are going back to the vetting, what yeah. sort of tools are you using to choose that? Or what I use a lot. I use eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and read myself. Um, there's lots of tools you can use for vetting. Um, a lot of people will, please tell me nobody in this room has ever bought a follower. If you have, you need to scrub your accounts. And I'll just put that out there. Never ever buy a follower. Simply don't, it's not worth it. Um, I use, fake follower checks, I use, I go in and look at your numbers. If your percentage of comments is nil, like on Instagram, for example, I look at your engagement numbers. If people are actually engaging with your content, um, it's often real, so I'll look at engagement numbers, I'll look at your engagement percent, and then I'll also go in and read, like I go in and read blog posts, I go back so I don't use a lot of, like I don't use Cision, I don't use, I look at them to see who the, their influencer list is, then I go through an eyeball. I literally go through an eyeball. It takes me about 10 to 15 minutes to vet one person. And I'm paid for my list. If you pass my vet, <laughs> you made it, literally. So there seems to be a trend right now, or I don't know if it's a trend, but um, friends are responding to everybody who comments um, or messages them or texts. Yeah, them. and I, I, I believe that's important. What, where do you draw the line that like, when do you not write back to somebody? So if they write something negative, um, if it's a problem you can fix, I understand writing back and apologizing, but where do you draw the line? I will always, more? I will always, for brands, my, my, my go-to has always been, always reply immediately as soon as you can, and then take it to DM or email. Right. Like take but it if offline. it's just a, like a, not a constructive, a yeah, if it's just a, like, your brand sucks, uh, um, do you uh, ignore them? Um, usually if you get, your brand sucks, there's a reason why, yeah. and it's often good to get to the reason. So I will try to engage in a dialogue but I will take that dialogue offline. Does that uh, dialogue happen often? Do you yes. Ask oh yeah. With Flip, because um, I was a uh, social media, we got a lot of stuff on Facebook and uh, when they ask, oh, this flyer isn't available, this flyer's wrong, this flyer's there. And it's the sort of flyer that they want, and they want it right then. So, and 
if you're um, in a place that you can give a timeline, give a timeline to how fast an issue can be resolved. Because uh, for me, with the app, um, the app is down. Um, we have our engineers working on it. Our timeline right now, it's estimated to take 24 hours to get the app back up. Yeah, but if it's, this just sucks and doesn't work for me. Sometimes finding out why it doesn't work for them has led to an improvement in the actual app or branding. So sometimes it's good to find out. Facebook page. I do not. I never delete comments. I never take down anybody's comments ever, unless it's spam. Spam, I'll go in and get rid of. But an actual comment, <coughs> even negative against the brand, stays permanently. I think it's about transparency. If you're going to live online as a brand, you need to be transparent, and so that way people can go back in and see. Oh, they do answer people. Your response time matters too. If you work for a brand, I always say less than four hours online. And for the brands I work with, I guarantee them at least, I would answer the brand questions of people online within four hours. And worst case scenario on the weekends, 24. So you don't have to be sitting by your computer. For a seller. But have timelines that people know and advertise your timelines. They're important. Because people expect immediacy. In today's world, we like to know now or as quickly as possible. We don't want to wait. Because you don't want to let people fester. But I've already, uh, uh, I've already said, I've already said this, like, <coughs> da, 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 da. Um, like I'll use Blip for an example. Um, if it, I'll usually say, sorry, you're having an issue. Um, can, you, can you grab a screenshot of that issue and send it to me at? I'd love to help you with that issue. I'd leave it there online. But uh, if it's something that needs to be resolved, like say the app is down, I'll put out a huge message. Chicken is a problem, right? Yeah. You, you know, I found a pebble in your chicken. Yeah. Okay. Can you take a shot of that and send it to the app? Great. But the next person reading that, a week from now or a month from now, will not have seen the resolution for that. Um, How do you they'll, 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 they'll have seen that you've reached out, reached out and said, hey. Yeah. And if you do this and give me this information, I can help. I can help you. No, if it's been a huge issue, like uh, like our chicken farmers, we were in the media, we did TV, we did Facebook posts, we did a whole thing. If it was a huge issue that needs to be public. So, okay, if you're a bakery, yeah, and your bread with the, your croissants are a little crunchy that day, yeah, and the customer complains about that, and you and you. If you will come in, I will give you a whatever. And then I leave it like that. I just simply leave it like so, that. Or if it's a little more complex. The, the it all depends what the issue is. Like we'll use a bar for an example in the States. They recently had um, a huge issue um, with an employee putting up a really bad sign. And I'm not even going to say what the sign was because it was very, very derogatory. And they did it as a joke. And it was seen by the, some in the community who would be rightfully offended. The owner 
came back, not only filed, fired the person who created the poster, but also came out publicly and said, we're going to do A, B, C. Um, and because it was to do with domestic violence. And so they're raising funds for the whole month. All the domestic beers, are go um, profits are going to a local dom domestic violence shelter. So it all depends the degree of the mistake of what actions need to be taken. If it's big, a big action needs to be taken. If it's little, then that little comment at the bottom is all that needs to be out there. It has to be proportionate to be offended. And just to jump in, like I think it's small enough. I think just the act of you engaging and saying, yeah. oh, we're going to deal with this, yes. is all you really, it's like, oh, this brand, a customer has an issue and they're working to solve that. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know exactly what the resolution is, but I'm great. I'm happy to know that they're working yeah, like I, I don't, I don't care if the problem didn't get solved. The fact that the company is going through the effort of actually trying to solve it is enough for me to go, okay, you know what? This is a problem. The problem was um, your screws kept pop popping out of this thing. Okay, well we've had that complaint from several people, so now we can. This is the, this was the problem. We can give you a refund for this. We are doing a new prototype that, will, that fixes this problem. Yeah. People don't need to know that you do that, but so long as you've reached out to the person that's had the problem and said, hey, look, I'll try and fix it, it's now on the onus of the person that had the problem to follow whatever instructions you give. Yeah. It's no longer on your shoulders as the business. Um, just, uh, Holly, your thoughts on when it's the other way, when a company becomes adamant about a, pop, uh, a position about their product or service that um, angers more and more people as as the attention goes viral, as the attention increases. And the authenticity, um, just an observer, I keep finding then in the people reacting. Mm -hmm. And I find also just sort of, uh, you talked about trending trop topics, people jumping on board to just hammer um, unfairly that brand or that company, they're using that opportunity to, to, to air their grief about something else. Um, just um, It happens. Like I remember with Air Canada and the Tanner incident, a lot of people jumped on board with like the how, how dare you. And Air Canada took a major hit. Um, it happens. And it takes a while for it to die down. And then you have to look at some of your key messaging as a brand afterwards. Um, it's sometimes when things go viral, if you're a brand and you don't take the bull by the horns, you're going to get screwed. Well, maybe I, 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 I'm not asking the right way. How should we, just as individual customers, consumers online, behave when the brand goes? Um, well, I hope that if you've had a good brand experience, sometimes things can happen to a brand where, say, something does happen and it goes viral, somebody, there's been a mistake of some sort, but if you've had a good experience, I've seen sometimes people go to bat for a brand, and sometimes your best brand advocates will go to bat for you. I've seen, like on our flip app, I've seen sometimes messages back and forth between users on our Facebook page where it's the person, the brand advocate, advocating for the brand. And that's what you want. That's what you want to build. Where, where you've got brand advocates who know your messaging better than you know it. Because th when they share it, it's real. When they're helping each other, that's community, and that's what you want to build. Um, we have just a few minutes left, and um, one of the things that happened this week, which I, who here loves WestJet as much as I do? 
I wanted to share a WestJet story this week because it could have turned into a major disaster. One of my girlfriends was flying WestJet um, this week. Her father passed away. And we had bad, bad weather here this week, and the plane was delayed two hours. The plane delaying two hours meant she would miss her connection and wouldn't get to the funeral home on time. WestJet changed her itinerary, had her plane met in Vancouver with a taxi cab waiting so she could get to where she had to go on time, which I thought was kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of been making the rounds on Facebook lately this week because um, the person who it happened to be is somebody who um, is quite a well-known Canadian blogger, but I don't think they did it because she was a blogger. I just think that's their authentic voice. They tr do try to help when they can. And I thought it was just really brought home the message of authenticity and customer service. If you are behind a brand's messaging, you are the voice of the company. You are their customer service agent. Um, yes, most of your job is PR, but over half of it qualifies as upper level customer service. So you need, when you're building your voice, it needs to have that human voice of listening. Anybody else with questions? Just a comment. Uh, the, the, your, your comment on the fact that a company was, may not have fixed the problem, said we haven't fixed the problem, but we're working on it. I think the, the key to me has always been the word care. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me it was established in the first Tylenol case that um, that rather than reacting to, uh, in a corporate sense, uh, the company said, oh my God, we're appalled, we care, in other words. And if that isn't the first message in, in uh, disaster <laughs> yeah. situations, then something is wrong. You know? The fact is caring about others, a genuine caring, mm -hmm. let's get that right, not just the fake I care, when you genuinely care and want to help others, to me has been the most beneficial. I think my Twitter bio says helping Canadians one tweet at a time. And that has always been my goal, is to help others with what I'm messaging out. And you have? What happens if you, you have people online who they're not being authentic, right? You have people like, oh. It happens every say, day. Your, your app is well, the worst I've ever used. You're the worst. You should stop. Like, you have people who oh, just haters. are just haters. So how, yeah. do you, how do you deal with haters? Do you ignore them? Do you um, authentically reply to them? Like, what do you do? Scott Stratton has said this more beautifully than I can add. Um, the, the basically, he has said, um, don't be the jackass whisperer. He goes, like, um, don't. Don't worry about the haters. Haters will always hate. There's always going to be somebody who can find a complaint about something. Do you, do you reply to them or just ignore um, it, uh, If they're, I'll reply like once, like you say if it's a red, to try to engage in conversation, but if I can just tell they're just there to complain, I'll let it go. They do. Because I know, it, I, I, I know there, there must be a lot of anxiety when that starts up, especially for someone who's new and doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. 
On your blog, you're not writing very well. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was actually thrilled the first time I got a hate comment. I was actually, I actually, I was super excited. It was like yes. So yeah, a lot of a, a lot of I think branding inauthenticity starts from a point of fear. Yeah. And so when you're talking about you know, make this look bad, so we better do this boilerplate or something. And a lot, and a lot of people are chasing numbers, and oh, I've got to get to this certain level. Um, I'm here, and will nicely tell you, you don't need to get to a certain number. You need to reach the right, reach the right audience. So by having your your voice be exactly on brand and on messaging, you will get the sales that you need. Period. You will reach the audience that you want, as long as you stick to that. And I think that completes us, guys. So you've got about ten minutes. To the next one. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Uh, if you want to follow me, commonsensemom.com. If you want to know who I'm working with right now, I'm working for a brand new startup called Cattle. Um, if you're into cashback apps, like check out 51, this will be the competitor, but I like it a lot better because it also pays you for engaging with brands. So you're actually being paid to watch the advertising. <laughs>